This is landing zone Oasis, approximately 56 kilometers southwest of Pleiku. The date is 3 June, and during the past 18 days of Operation Paul Revere, the 25th Infantry Division lost three helicopters to enemy fire during bitter battles with the Viet Cong in the Central Highlands area. Today, Tropic Lightning troops are standing by, ready for another thrust at the Vietnamese communists. A battery of 105s near the forward base landing strip is firing a support mission against suspected VC positions a few kilometers away and begin preparing a new landing zone for the next assault. Below is objective Alpha 10, where Operation Paul Revere will be continued. As is usual, thick ground cover prevents positive observation of the results of the artillery barrage. The observation chopper, however, flies dangerously low to have a look narrowly avoiding an intercept with the incoming artillery fire. As soon as the shelling from the 105 howitzers ceases, helicopter gunships move in to reconnoiter by fire. Preparation of the landing zone is thorough. Then the wave of assault troops is airborne from Oasis as the task force moves to the objective. On the ground at Alpha 10, there is no immediate contact with the enemy, and the Tropic Lightning troopers spread out and begin a methodical sweep. Within the past week, the North Vietnamese 32nd and 33rd regiments have been encountered in the fierce fighting in this sector of the battlefront. In these earlier contacts, 372 VC were killed, while friendly casualties remained light. Now, after a two-day lull in the action, the men of the task force are once more boring into Viet Cong-held jungles. Then it happens. Contact. Enemy fire from somewhere ahead. A trip flare is accidentally set off by one of the men, and the deep shadow of the forest is suddenly brilliantly lit. The enemy breaks off contact and withdraws. Moving from one dense jungle patch to another, the troopers press forward, pursuing the VC ambushers. In the dim recesses of the overgrown labyrinth, however, the enemy escapes. A recon platoon sergeant rendezvous with the task force along the jungle trail and reports an unmapped village ahead. It is located in the foothills of the Play Ponuk Mountains. The men spread out and proceed up the winding trail in single file. As they move upward, they pass some mountain women with baskets strapped to their backs, but no Viet Cong are seen. As they near the reported village, the Tropic Lightning Troopers come to an area where the mountain people have been cutting timber. Some of the cuttings look quite fresh. In this maze of downed timber, the troops set up a base of fire while other units begin probing the village. Soon, a suspect is brought up the hill and is searched and interrogated. His belongings reveal nothing. Another Montagnard is brought in for questioning. These tribesmen are quite primitive. They carry stone axes and weapons of wood in their loincloths. They seem quite friendly and are willing talkers. In discussions with several of the villagers, interrogators learn that the VC have passed through the area during the past two days, but that none are in the vicinity now. Meanwhile, back at the area base at Oasis, a helicopter brings Brigadier General Glenn D. Walker, Assistant Division Commander, to a meeting with the Brigade Commander. They discuss a reported enemy division headquarters in this area. General Walker is shown a Russian-made SKS 7.62 rifle captured during the fighting in recent days. The general also sees captured enemy radio equipment demonstrated by a sergeant. Eighty-two millimeter Chinese mortar shells are shown. 
and masher-type grenades, all are of interest to technical intelligence. Captured canteens, web belts, and rucksacks are burned and destroyed after examination. Here in the Eadrong Valley area, Operation Paul Revere continues. In another action involving troops of the 25th Infantry Division, films were made on 5 and 6 June of Operation Fort Smith in Long An Province. 64 kilometers south-southeast of Saigon, these troops and Vietnamese police are heading for the village of Ap Bin. Some of the vehicles have loudspeakers mounted on them. Upon arrival at the village, the troopers find it deserted. The villagers have fled the area. Every house and building is deserted. The reasons for the strange behavior of the residents is not clear. To find out more, the troopers search the area thoroughly. Deep tunnels with hidden entrances are found, and some rather unorthodox methods are used to examine them. There are no occupants. Explosive charges are prepared, and the tunnels are then destroyed. Some of the deeper, more elaborate diggings continue to smoke after the explosions, and the openings are watched for any sign of life. A search of the dwellings reveals some to be Viet Cong homes, and they are burned by Vietnamese police. As the units move on, a mine destroys one of the vehicles blocking the road. Removal operations begin. Members of a security and assault platoon immediately begin sweeping operations to determine the location of any additional mines. However, none are found, and the units move on. Realizing the potential danger on this mission, the troops are alert to any signs of Viet Cong booby traps along the way. They look for trip wires and other hidden devices, but none are encountered. Reaching the next village, the infantrymen and Vietnamese police find the situation to be exactly as it was at the previous hamlet. They peer and probe everywhere looking for hidden weapons. Only an old man and a young girl remain in the village. They are questioned at length as to the whereabouts of the residents, but merely say they have gone. The infantrymen move on, and the operation continues. Army demolition experts confer on the problem of blowing up Viet Cong tunnels. Soil analysis crews of the 159th Engineer Group take measurements to determine the effectiveness of tunnel blasting techniques. The tunnels have plagued Allied troops and could not be destroyed effectively. Now, a new method of tunnel demolition using acetylene gas. On 25 May, engineers of the 173rd Airborne Brigade carry the new equipment to blow tunnels during Operation Hardihood at Baria. A tunnel entrance is spotted. The area around it is scanned for other openings. Many of the tunnels are vast, intricate complexes, extending several hundred meters. Some are built on three levels and are equipped with underground rooms for storage of weapons and military supplies. The equipment for generating and blowing the gas is set up near the tunnel entrance. An electrically operated blasting cap is placed in the tunnel opening. A smoke grenade is thrown inside. 
Then the tunnel entrance is completely sealed off. And the area is carefully observed for any traces of smoke from hidden openings. This gives the demolition team an idea of the tunnel's configuration. The new demolition method is simply to flood the cave with volatile acetylene gas and ignite the gas with the blasting cap. The resultant explosion will collapse the tunnel. A solution of calcium carbide and water produces the gas in metal containers. The gas is introduced into the tunnel through tubing. A leak produces an accidental explosion and this man has to be washed down with water. Now everything is set. The blowers push the gas into the tunnel. And the gas is detonated. Other tunnels in the area are blown up. The new technique of destroying the Viet Cong tunnels does a more thorough job of neutralizing them than any of the previous methods. In the woods northwest of Kushi, a demolition team with the 25th Infantry Division will use the new method to blow up a newly discovered Viet Cong cave. Brigadier General Edward H. de Saussure, Assistant Division Commander, 25th Infantry, confers with Major Jack E. Maury, Engineer Officer, on the use of the new equipment. For long tunnels, several of the acetylene gas units may be connected together to produce more of the gas. A standard army mighty might blower is used to spread the gas throughout the tunnel. Destruction of the tunnels in this way makes it unnecessary to risk casualties by entering them for the purpose of clearing out the VC. Memorial Day in Vietnam. In front of headquarters, United States Army, Vietnam, in Tonsonut, shortly before noon, a ceremony is held, honoring the memory of the American men and women who have given their lives to preserve our national ideals of freedom. The services begin as a chaplain delivers the invocation. Lieutenant General Gene E. Engler, Deputy Commanding General of USARV, speaks briefly on the meaning of this day and the sacrifices that members of our armed forces have made throughout America's history. Taps are sounded, and moments later, the annual commemoration of Memorial Day comes to an end. General Glenn D. Walker, Assistant Division Commander of the 25th Infantry Division, is presented with tokens of appreciation for his unit's help to the people of South Vietnam. Handsomely made by civilians in the area, the gifts are symbolic of the friendship felt by freedom-loving Vietnamese for the American fighting man. Gifts are also presented to members of General Walker's staff by Vietnamese girls in traditional dress. A colorful ceremony and a welcome one for the hard-fighting 25th. The base camp of the 3rd Brigade, 25th Infantry Division at Pleiku is the scene of hilarity as the USO brings over a new show to entertain the troops. TV and nightclub performer Big Tiny Little heads up the act, which features a combo of top-notch players who know how to take a tune for a ride and have fun doing it. Pop singer Mary Petit goes over big with the boys. The USO provides two new shows a month to play the Vietnam circuit, plus visits of famous stage and screen personalities. USO performers 
hurdle the Viet Cong ridden jungle in helicopters to bring entertainment to our fighting forces wherever they may be. Next stop for the big tiny little show, Cameron Bay. PFC Mike Baker, U.S. Army Special Photographic Detachment, Pacific, reporting from the Army Procurement Agency, Japan, in Yokohama. The Army Procurement Agency, Japan, is a unit of the U.S. Army, Japan, and is unique among purchasing agencies as it combines all the functions of procurement within one activity. Here to explain the mission of the agency is Colonel E.V. Lau, Commanding Officer of the U.S. Army Procurement Agency, Japan. This agency provides indigenous labor, utilities and supplies for the United States forces in Japan. This fulfills a need which cannot be met by the military supply system within the time frame required. The agency's support then goes beyond U.S. Army Japan. What other units of activities uh, do you support? We support the United States Army, Navy and Air Force elements in Japan as well as those elements throughout the Western Pacific. We also support the military assistance program in the Western Pacific area. The Army Procurement Agency Japan is unique in that you maintain facilities not normally found in one activity. Just what are the other facilities, Colonel? We have legal talent, financial management assistance, engineers, inspectors, and price analysts to form a complete team assisting the contracting officer in the Procurement Operations Division. The Quality Assurance Division operates a procurement test facility capable of verification testing of chemical, electrical, and physical properties. These tests ensure that the raw material and end items meet quality standards set forth in the contract. The Quality Assurance Division approves and monitors the contractor's quality control. As a result of their modern controls and capacity of production, Japan now acts as an extension of the U.S. supply system to meet the immediate and extraordinary needs of the Army in Asia. This highway bridge, 11 kilometers west of Santo Domingo, was undermined by floodwaters on 28 May, causing the center section to collapse. In response to Dominican President Hector Godoy's request to establish an emergency bridge across the Haina River, the United States flew in 795,000 pounds of bridge parts in Air Force planes. There were 20 flights starting 3 June. Even complete power boats came in by air. Matched level truck beds with rollers facilitate handling the heavy units. At San Isidro Airport, men of an engineer company from Fort Benning set out for the bridge site. They convoy the first sections of the M4-T6 floating bridge. The pontons are rapidly inflated. Individual sealed sections ensure buoyancy should any one section fail. The inflated pontons are then saddled with a superstructure designed to bear the roadbed. The last portion is hammered into place. As each section is completed, it is launched by the men. U.S. Army personnel stationed in the Dominican Republic aid in the actual construction of the bridge. Starting at the river bank, metal sections are laid to form the road bed leading out onto the pontons. They are designed to interconnect in an alternating pattern. The boats flown in by C-130s are now at work moving the bridge sections into position. Enough sections must be prepared and placed to span the 152 meter width of the river. The bridge is 4.2 meters wide and designed to support 55 tons. As the work progresses, word of the rapidly growing bridge spreads throughout the countryside. A tower to handle guy lines is erected. The crane is used to raise the wire cable to which each ponton will be attached by its own rope. 
These guy lines will give the bridge stability during tropical storms and changes in the river currents. This emergency link in a vital Dominican highway is a major gesture of goodwill to the country. The speed and scope of the operation proves interesting to onlookers. On 6 June, cars line up hours ahead of time to be among the first to cross over the bridge. At 1500 hours, the official party with the Inter-American Peace Force Commander, General Braha, starts across the bridge, which will benefit the entire community. Information is being collected for joint Thai U.S. training and recognition manuals, the Blue Book of Coastal Vessels, Thailand. Field interrogation teams are composed of Thai naval officers and civilian engineers. Ships like these in the river have already been cataloged as part of Project Agile. The program director is a U.S. naval officer from the Office, Secretary of Defense, Advanced Research Projects Agency. Deputy Project Leader is an American from the Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio. The Gulf of Thailand holds tens of thousands of ships, so important to the people in nearby countries, and yet so dangerous to their military security. Miles of the exposed coastline could be easily infiltrated. Here, engineers work with their part of the questionnaire. Photographs are shot. The ship's main characteristics are detailed, such as length overall, beam measurements, anchor, net capacity of hold, and other construction data. The visit is made with the permission of the ship's captain, who gives statistics for the information forms. To obtain data on the height of the mast, an abney level is sighted. It takes about three hours to obtain the necessary information on this size junk. Two ties and a U.S. information specialist collate the data. This book is the outgrowth of an earlier junk blue book of Vietnam. The earlier book was prepared to support stop and search operations along the Vietnamese coast. The deputy director inspects the results of the questions asked by the Thai field workers. It is his job to coordinate and edit the final published volume, The Blue Book of Coastal Vessels, Thailand. In Bangkok, Thailand, Major Emmett Sims, senior U.S. Army Ordnance Supply Advisor, accompanies his counterpart in the Royal Thai Army on an inspection tour. This ordnance depot supplies Class II and Class IV items. The manner in which these are handled within the installation is of particular concern to the officers. Storage facilities of the automotive supply section are also carefully checked in this joint inspection. Such cooperative efforts play a large part in upgrading the efficiency and effectiveness of the Royal Thai Army Ordnance Depots. A maintenance company in Bang Kien also has a familiar visitor, Captain Leo J. Pigotty, the U.S. Army Automotive Maintenance Advisor. Here, he observes the changing of a motor in a Toyota truck Captain Pigotty also serves as the advisor to another maintenance company here in Bangkok. This unit repairs automotive assemblies turned in through supply channels. This mission requires highly trained personnel, efficient organization, and properly maintained facilities. To stimulate the achievement of these goals, Captain Pigotty maintains a close and congenial liaison with his Thai counterpart.
His visits to observe and comment on the unit's operations are an important and productive part of his job. I am Sergeant Major Cooper, Airborne Liaison Officer for MAG Japan. On May 22nd, the 1st Airborne Brigade, Japan Self-Defense Force, celebrated their 15th anniversary. Since its creation in 1952 as a 100-man cadre of the National Police Reserve, the brigade has grown into the strike force of the Japanese Self-Defense Forces. Organized with World War II equipment provided by the military aid program, the brigade is now capable of making parachute assaults of a battalion combat team size. All of the equipment here is built in Japan for the self-defense forces. It includes two and a half ton trucks, 105 millimeter howitzers, mechanical mules, a new 7.62 millimeter light machine gun, and this Willis Jeep built by Mitsubishi Industries under rights purchased from the U.S. patent holder. Because of their compatibility and accessibility, these Jeeps and other Japanese-produced equipment have been procured for use by the U.S. Army in the Pacific and for map countries in Asia. In this program, 2,274 officers and men attended one or more Army schools in the United States under military aid program training. Japan is one of a very few countries which paid for transportation of its personnel sent to Army schools under MAP training. Keystone in the compatible development is the frequent and personal contact of MAG personnel with their counterparts. Contact is active at all levels between the 33 members of the Army section of MAG Japan and their counterparts. The Medical Regulating Office, or JAMRO, controls the movement of patients from hospitals in Vietnam to other areas in the Western Pacific Command. With me is the Assistant Chief of JAMRO Far East, Air Force Captain Edward G. Knizel. Sir, joint medical regulating means that this is a tri-service activity. Does this mean that you're regulated by the Department of Defense? No, the Department of the Army is the executive agency for medical regulating, both with overseas and in the United States. We are presently set up under SYNCPAC as a tri-service organization as of May of 1965 due to the Vietnam hostilities. We are assigned to the U.S. Army Medical Command, Japan, for administrative and logistic support. Mm -hmm. Our staff includes Army, Navy, and Air Force representatives, both officer and enlisted. Captain Knizel, would you explain to us in brief what is med medical regulating? We can uh, control the, the flow of patients from Vietnam to the Pacific Command and within the Pacific Command and from PACCOM to CONUS. Mm -hmm control the patients by specialties, directing them to specialized treatment facilities. The object is to try and keep from overloading a particular facility in that specialty. Our objective is to try and keep the military in hospitals of their parent service. Today we have seen what is behind the swift and efficient movement of patients from hospitals in Vietnam to the other service hospitals in the Western Pacific. JAMRO, in its performance of duty, is helping to fulfill the goal of medical evacuation in that it is administratively controlling the evacuation of patients to provide for complete treatment, convalescence, and return to duty of Armed Forces personnel.